Yeah, hey, I'm Chuck Liddell. You're watching Icebreakers. Watching Icebreakers. My name's Adam Ray. I'm on the show, too. Trying to catch the ball. Yeah! Fuck! <laughs> Welcome back to Icebreakers. First guest in the house, the great Dana White. Dana, you said you can't say no to Chuck. What's behind that? Can anyone say no to Chuck? <laughs> um, yeah, probably not. You guys go back how far? Is this like, I mean, I'm we're meeting for the first time, but you guys, I feel like, have a... Uh, we have a long history. Yeah. yeah. Late 90s. We met in the late 90s. And how yeah, was, was my, it? He was my manager like, back back in the day. Dana, before he was... This I, got, I think I kind of got introduced to mixed martial arts that way, correct? That's right. So we, we, we had a mutual friend and a guy named John Lewis. And John Lewis was really the first jiu-jitsu instructor in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, we started training with him. We being my partners, the Fertitta brothers and I. And um, once we started to really get into it, he started to bring fighters around, you know, Chuck, Tito, and uh, BJ Penn, and a lot of those guys. And that's how we started to meet everybody. And then, you know... I, I, Chuck and I ended up becoming real close, and uh, yeah, I started managing him. Can you tell with somebody when you meet him for the first time that they're, you know, born for the cage? Like, obviously, I can see the way you're looking at me being like, yeah, dude, you're born to work at, like, a frozen yogurt stand or maybe be, like, a rabbi's assistant. <laughs> but but when you look at Chuck, like, it's just overwhelming, right? Like, you're like, this guy's got uh, some extra meat that needs to be utilized properly. Well, there's a few things, too. You know, I, I, I came from boxing, so... I used to I used to spar with with all these guys and, and and stuff like that, and a lot of the guys that, that that were, you know, in MMA at that time, really had no hands. Chuck had hands, feet, and Chuck hit really fucking hard, man. He hit like a truck, and uh, you know he had the look and the whole thing. I, from the first day that I ever met Chuck, I thought that Chuck could be a big star. Uh, and you were right. Uh, wait, now how do you the the quick hands? Is that something that I mean, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, not as experienced with all this as you guys are, but is how um, how much does that contribute to the overall package? Like, are there a certain is there a checklist that you're looking at with somebody? And, and I'd like to hear from both of you guys on this, like that you you think you need to have and that you, you want to see in someone. Yeah, well, it wasn't even about quick hands at that time. I said he had hands. Chuck Liddell had hands and he had power. He had knockout power. And, and really, if you look at you have to look at the, at the era, the era that Chuck came from. Chuck had uh, great wrestling. Great takedown defense, kicks, knees, elbows, and heavy hands. Oh, and the most important thing, a fucking chin of steel. So, you, you know, you, you put all that together. It, it hit me in the head with a brick and I keep coming at you. You know, like back, back in the day, you know. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck had an unbelievable chin and, uh, and Chuck loved to fight. Chuck loved to fight. He wouldn't turn down anybody. He'd fight anybody. Um, you know, what's funny is throughout my, my, my 20 year career here at the UFC, you know, I, I fight with guys all the time about not wanting to fight somebody, you know, I'll get into arguments with guys. I would get into arguments with Chuck cause I'd be like, no, no, you're not fucking fighting that guy. We're, let's, let's, let's wait. Wait, wait. Hey, remember, Hey, I'll tell you, that's a good story with that one. Remember, uh, Tim Sylvia, when you had, uh, Randy fight him instead of me. I asked you to fight him. I wanted to fight him. I would have been the first two th two two way champ. I wanted to fight him, and he went out there and he, th he threw that overhand right. And I looked at you like, dropped that, came up right out and dropped with that overhand right. I looked over and said, "You're like okay." Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, no, it's true. Listen, uh, that, that it, all, all these things that we're talking about, the, you know, Chuck was a true fighter to the core, and uh, it's why he became so famous. It's why he's so beloved. In his day, Chuck Liddell was the man, and, and, and all he wanted to do was fight. Congrats, by the way. You touched on 20 years in the UFC. It's fucking incredible, man. I don't know how you're celebrating other than, uh, you know, humble bragging with your rock star memorabilia behind us. We got a fucking, we got, you know, some Jenga uh, set that a meth head put together. Uh, but uh, what, um, how can you compare... First of all, what does it feel like when you sit back? Do you take a moment to actually like go, holy shit, and reflect and go down memory lane? Or is it just like, because I know you're such a workhorse that do you uh, do you stop to smell the roses, so to speak? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all about it's all about what's next, what's next. And, and uh, you know, that, that's what I'm always thinking about, because the, the, the thing has so much potential to be so much bigger. 
And the problem is there's just not enough time. There's not enough time in the day. There's not enough time in the week, month, et cetera, to, to get all the things done th th that we want to. Um, so you do the best I can. I, I don't sit around and dwell about what we've done. It's about what we can still do. Did you guys kind of, uh, in the 90s, once you kind of started to get into it, um, first of all, take me through that first fight. Once you guys start working together, do you remember, like, the conversations you were having pre-fight? I, I, was... I think pre-fight, the one thing that was always consistent was Dana would go to me, um, Chuck, you got to win this fight. <laughs> you got to no, win this fight. No pressure, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chuck, by the way, you got to win this fight. <laughs> but it was one of those things that, that I always felt like, like, um, you know, like I said in the beginning, Chuck could be this huge superstar. And as we started to build and grow this thing, um, you know, every fight was the most important fight. This is the most important fight. The next fight's the most important fight. And uh, I, I used to stress and sweat every single fight we had way more than he did. Now, why, uh, I mean, just why was that extra, pre I mean, you were, what, kind of joking, but also was, was it just kind of the, knowing what was at stake with the growth of the sport and needing, like, oh, go ahead. Well, in the beginning, I mean, he was my manager and it was like, he was just, he was growing my career. Right. If you want to keep going and get going, we, we, we didn't, we didn't take the UFC deal that we were offered because it was shit. And so he got me a, a fight somewhere else, said, but you've got to win this fight. Right. You know, you can't, we, you're fighting on a smaller show. I'm putting you on a back on a smaller show. You need, you need to win this fight impressively. Right. You know, you got to go out and I knocked the kid, kick the kid in the head, I think, and knocked him out. Yeah. So in the beginning, what Chuck's saying is, you know, I used to manage him. He wasn't in the UFC. The UFC didn't want Chuck. They, whatever, for whatever reason, those guys didn't see what I saw and didn't think what I thought. They, they, they weren't interested in Chuck. So, uh, you know, I was, I was grinding to try to get him in the UFC. So we would get these, you know, we got him a title fight. Um, what was that? Steve Heath. We got him a title fight with a guy named Steve Heath in the IFC. And, uh, you know, I was like, Chuck, you, you, you have to impress these guys. And, and it was for, for a title in, in that organization. And I, as usual, Chuck went in there and, and was incredibly impressive. And then we ended up, you know, the way the thing, whole thing played out is we ended up buying the UFC. And now I'm running the whole show. So now I can literally, you know, I couldn't be his manager anymore, but I could, I could control his career. That's like some Ari Gold shit when he was trying to, uh, you know, work at the studio and get Vince that uh, smoke jumpers lead. Um, that's exactly. That's funny. That's exactly what it was like. Come on, right? Uh, so that the '90s, you know how? I mean, as a comic too, like, and I'm sure just, you know, uh, we're the same age and have the same body. But like, when uh, in the '90s, that was a joke. He didn't laugh. All right. Sometimes it's <laughs> gonna be Zoom lag. Uh, but Dana, in the '90s, people talk about. I know for myself. My boy Jaleel White just came out with a new Purple Urkel weed, right? Uh, based on his character, Steve Urkel. Family Matters, to me, is a, one of the greatest sitcoms of all time. I think anyone from that era goes, you know, the time they grew up in was the best shows, the best music, the best whatever. How, but how do you, because you are such a what's next, and obviously the sport has grown, you know, to be just a, a juggernaut. But is there something about that 90s time when it was getting, when you were kind of just getting all the ducks in order that, uh, that where the energy was was, I don't know, more raw, more exciting because it was on the way up? I would, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if I would say it was more raw or more exciting, but, you know, we, we, were, we were much younger. We had a vision. Um, you know, what was awesome was the people that we had met um, through training were the guys that we were building and, the you know, from Chuck Tito, BJ Penn, uh, the, the list goes on and on of guys that we had met before we were even involved. Uh, in the UFC. And these were the guys that were all a part of this thing now. And, you know, we literally turned all of them into stars, you know, um, th th these guys now are all the legends of the sport. So when you get involved in the early days like that, I mean, the, where we are today and what we did in the past are all just, it's all just shit that we used to dream about. And, and we actually did it. Everything that we said we were going to do, we did. I'd like to hear from both you guys on maybe the moment that you felt like, I don't know if it was the first uh, real big match or when you just felt like shit was clicking. And like you just said, like, you know, the dream and everything was kind of coming to fruition. And maybe Chuck, where you felt like, 
oh, wow, I'm starting to kind of really make a name for myself. And Danny, you're like, dude, we're just getting going. This shit's about to blow up. Like, was there one moment or one match? No, for me, there was. I mean, if you want to talk when it exploded, when I really noticed that we went, we became mainstream. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's one thing. I, I When I started working, you know, fighting, I was fighting for a living. I got to do what I love for a living. I'm like, I'm really, am I just fighting for, I'm making money fighting? Yeah. Every, I mean, I, I, all along the way, I was excited. I mean, it just, and it got bigger than I thought it ever would in my, t- my time. I always thought it'd get huge, but it, I thought it'd take forever. But the Ultimate Fighter was where, right after that show aired, right after I got that title, like, it went from me being able to walk around the mall and look around and point out, okay, that guy with the tap out shirt probably knows who I am. That guy <laughs> over there probably knows, the, you know, that, that, that guy over there probably knows. To, like, I couldn't tell. And people were just coming up, you know, old ladies, uh, Oh, yeah. man, I, like random people, like I just, everybody, the, all walks of life coming up to me. Hey, man, great fight the other night. Or, hey, I saw you on that show. Wow. I, cool show. I went, went, and that was just all almost overnight. He's absolutely right. After we filmed the first season of The Ultimate Fighter and that thing aired, and when Chuck went in and, 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 and fought Randy for the title, it literally exploded. I mean, even going into that se- season, Chuck was already at, at, at like that, that rock star level, man. And, uh, I, I, you know, he was dating the little pop star that did the show with us at, at that time. Uh, you know, he, he was out in the clubs literally all night till the morning. And then he would show up from the clubs to, to the Ultimate Fighter to film. I mean, he, he was already on that trajectory uh, of, of rock star. And I, I say it all the time with people. When the fights when the fights were over, I used to throw these big parties up in my uh, up in my suite at either Mandalay Bay or or the MGM, and we would have uh, sponsors or you know Directv or the people from the cable systems. And after a Chuck Liddell fight, you know I would tell Chuck, "You got you got to come up to my suite and just come up and say hi to everybody. It'll, it'll take you know 20, 25 minutes, and I'll, I'll get you out of there." When I would tell people that Chuck Liddell was coming up to the room, they would lose their fucking minds, man. He was he was at this level then that was, you know, and these are the people in the cable industry. They 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 put on concerts and have, you know, deals that they do with celebrities all the time. But Chuck had, had blown up. And then and then when he knocked Tito out, um, it went to a whole nother level. Is there something about, I mean, again, like, you know, you said you saw something in Chuck that you couldn't understand that other people couldn't see, but is there like a star, like, I mean, Chuck had fucking swagger, still does, you know, it's like, you know, a lot sweeter than I anticipated him being, you know, he cried before the podcast started, you know, because he missed you. So it's like, there's, you know, there's a lot, <laughs> no, I'm joking, but there's a, you know, just even like the walkout, like are, how much of that stuff are you as a manager? And then even just now with, you know, kind of being at the helm for a lot of personalities, are you trying to kind of facilitate? And how much of that, like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, all of that, all of that. I mean, um, you know, so we take, from, from the very beginning, you know, getting Chuck these fights, promoting Chuck, you know, whether it's on the posters or features that we put together, his walkout, his walkout music. I mean, it, 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 he'll tell you right now, I was involved in all that. I mean, I still am today. All of those things are key components into taking a guy and turning him into a superstar. If I do my job and Chuck does his, I mean, it's the perfect formula to build people into superstars. And then once you get through all that stuff, the the harder part is these guys dealing with the fame and the money and, you know, the girls and the, you know, all these things that come along with it. You know, and, you know, we had that moment with, with Chuck. I mean, th- this dude was w- was fighting his ass off. He he was ruling the world. He was cashing big fucking checks. He had sponsors. He had all that shit. Um, but uh, as much of a rock star as he was inside the sport, he was outside the sport, too, meaning in the clubs and fucking hanging out and doing all that shit. And then ended up, you know, the, the infamous interview that he did down in Texas where he, 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 I don't know, was out partying all night and then, you know. I, I actually, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the record for that one. I, I actually, that night I didn't go out. I hadn't gone out because I was sick from going out. I took Ambien. 
had my buddy gave me an because I was having problems sleeping, and I, I know how they woke me up. <laughs> I, that that was my reaction. I, they they, they didn't they they, they, were, they got me they didn't wake me up mentally, but they got me they, they got me to the they got me to that that show somehow. Uh, I don't know how, but so me me and my partner Lorenzo, literally after that interview, jumped on a plane and flew straight to where he was and sat down with him and you know. Chuck, what the fuck is going on? And, 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 you know, uh, you know, to see if there was anything that he needed that we could help him with. So, um, yeah, we're, we're involved in pretty much everything to do with these guys' lives, you know, while they're here with us. That's a, I mean, you're, it's a yeah, lot I, to take. I actually, okay. I, like, I don't, that, that day, I, like, they did, they flew out to see me and, and that was cool. That was really cool. Like, but for me, like, I don't, I didn't even remember getting home. Like, and, and think about this, I was in Texas. I had to fly to San Diego, and someone drove me from San Diego to Slow, and I don't remember getting home. What the That's fuck? how bad that was. I, that, that night, I, it was the weirdest. I was just watching some uh, interviews with you the last couple of days, and uh, I mean, it's, you know, you're in a, a world and a sport where, like, obviously being physically fit is, like, necessary. Do you... Have you, have you always been somebody that's like tried to keep that locked and loaded or are you around it? Like for me, like even just, you know, watching this shit, like, or even going to an NBA game and I'll see LeBron's arms and I'm like, God damn, I got to get a bow flex. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, are you, are you as being around it? Does that give you a little boost? Well, I can tell you this and, and, and probably anybody who's ever built a business from the ground up will tell you this in the early days, I didn't take care of myself at all. You know, I, uh, I, I was running this business and doing whatever it took, uh, you know, to, to, sh to show up every day to fly here, fly there, you know, go, go however many hours a day, you know, it, it didn't matter. All that mattered was running the business. And then, you know, once we got this thing to a place where, you know, we had a real business, um, you, you know, the thing was cruising. That, then I really started focusing on getting in shape. You guys were talking about uh, the walkout and everything. And I know, you know, rest in peace, DMX, just a couple of days ago. Uh, but that, how do, I mean, you had a, uh, you know. Uh, that, everyone, everyone was posting that DMX walkout I did for, uh, yeah. for Vanderlei. But I, during that, that fight, I, did, I did it for a few fights, actually. But that, that was a Are there some, uh, you know, famous moments, just um, walkouts that, that come to mind, Dana, when you're just like going through your 20 year, you know, reminiscing. Uh... Well, DMX is uh, for what, um, Ain't No Sunshine by, for uh, when uh, Anderson yeah, Silva, when Jack Anderson Silva, and, and um, Anderson Silva came out to him. That was, that was a, oh uh, shit. That was one of my favorite walkouts. That one and, well, Matt Hughes, Country Boy Can't Survive, but yeah, it's a little different. Yeah. And, 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 you know, uh, like you just said, Anderson Silva did, plus DMX did a lot of voiceovers for us back in the day. We did some, some voiceover stuff with him. So, uh, yeah, we, he was connected to the UFC in, in, in many ways, and uh, he was a great dude. I knew him personally. So, yeah, we did a tribute for him uh, during the fight last weekend. You've had to adjust big time, uh, obviously, uh, and, you know, Everybody has, even comics. Like I know, you know, Rogan's your boy, and him going to Austin has, you know, shaken up the comedy community um, uh, for for uh, for the better. I think because, you know, it's making a lot of people kind of, you know, really focus in on what they want, right? If it's going to Austin to really kind of pursue more stand up or stay in L.A. to kind of be around more acting opportunities, um, you know, uh, how did you even approach when things shut down? And if this is like a fucking broken record and Chuck wants to step in and find a different way to ask this. But, but I, again, I know, you know, Bob Menery, our, our, our mutual pal, and I know he went out there to Fight Island and, uh, and you know, just seeing him, his travels and talking about it was, was exciting. And also, like, you know, even he was like, I don't know what to expect. And I don't know if you did or if there was, again, you just have this mindset of like, all right, time to adjust. Here's what we're doing. Let's just execute it or something like that. Is there no real game plan for? Yeah, shutting down and laying people off and doing all those things absolutely made no sense to me. I, I didn't understand any of it ever. I was like, since when do you lay down for something and just quit and just, uh, you're going to ride out a virus? You're going to, you know, what? When's it going to go away? I mean, uh, the flu, the common cold, 
HIV. I mean, these things have been around forever. You're not going to just hide and ride this thing out. I, I was willing, I, I was going to build a, a, a lab here and, and, and figure out testing. And, and I was willing to do whatever it took. And I knew that we'd figure it out. I knew that I would spend the money to do it. And uh, I would do whatever it took to make this thing work and make it safe. And we did. I mean, everything again, like I was saying earlier, we did everything we said we were going to do when we bought this company. And uh, I did everything that I said I was going to do. I I'm not sure the amount you said you spent, but it was like 1,500 people that you flew over there from 40 different countries and you had all the testing. I mean, you guys just didn't spare any expense for that, yeah? Yeah, we, we ended up, we had $17 million last year in COVID expenses. Um, and uh, the number of people that we flew in and tested, it's a massive number. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a massive number. How did they receive it over there? <coughs> Loved it. And it was awesome. I mean, and especially for people, you know, for fighters, they want to stay active. They want to make money. They want to keep their career going. My employees want to take care of their families. And everybody wants to work. Everybody wants to, you know, um, nobody wants to sit home for a year and just sit in their house and do nothing. And, and, and especially, uh, you know, worry about, you know, are they going to have a job? Are they going to get paid? Are they going to do this? No, nobody wants that, man. And, and one of the things that I think was the most sad thing, you know, I, there's actually people I know that hid from COVID for a year and then died. And they didn't die from COVID. They died from, so you spent the last year of your life hiding in your house from a virus. Sad. Now, because it's become such a fearful thing, it, should some uh, young up and comer fighter out there be looking to name himself virus or even COVID? <laughs> because right out of the gate, you're going to have. <laughs> too soon. <laughs> too soon. Too soon. Yeah, yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, Okay, so that w that went well, right? You said it exceeded expectations. I mean, you know, I remember just, you know, how, how geeked out, you know, everybody was for that, that you were, you know, because obviously, like, every other sport was like, nah, we're going to just shut it down. And did you almost take that as a challenge, or was it just like, all right, you guys are just giving in too easily? They, they all gave into it. You know why? Because every other, all the other major sports are terrified of the media. That's why. I don't give a fuck about the media. Dude. um <laughs> i've and, seen and your youtube just, clips we just ripped through it have you always been that way that's what i want to ask too like is there yeah you know the... he's always been that way yeah, that <laughs> <way>. <laughs> the great thing about dana you know what he thinks he's, he won't he doesn't hide what he's thinking so is that no so now as a uh, as a fighter is that like do you want that blunt brutal honesty uh but i mean is there i always write i'd rather have someone tell, tell me what, what they think we don't always have to agree we always we haven't always agreed about everything but yeah hey i know how he feels he knows how i feel we're good yeah now we've always been friends true chuck and i always had a great relationship and always got along perfectly because uh there was there was never any bullshit with us we you know when when i didn't like something i'd tell him when he didn't like something he'd tell me and at the end of the day we were friends so we, we would work it out. And, and I was always out for his best interest, man. I always wanted whatever was, was best for Chuck. How did you uh, feel about the, uh, the nickname, the Iceman? Were you, uh, did you have a say in that? Did you? Uh... Oh, I, I had, uh, Iceman was my nickname long before I met Dan. Oh, okay, cool. I had nothing to do with that. Well, did you have any, when you he, when he came in, were you like, all right, cool, I, I dig that? Or is there, again, like, yeah, just no, having... it was awesome. The Iceman, I mean, it's, the, 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 it's one of the best ever. If it was like Mr. And Freeze, really you'd be like, that's taken. Was. To be honest with you, his, that was his personality. He was the ice man, man. He was ice cold about everything. He never, like I said, I would call him up and, and we, we got in fights about people that he wanted to fight that I didn't want him to fight. He, he was in position to, to fight Tito uh, for the title. And, you know, T Tito was, was ducking him at that time. And, uh, and, and he's like, I want to fight Babalu Sabral. I'm like, Babalu Sabral? That dude's fucking tough. I, uh, don't, no, no, you're not fighting fucking Bob Luce, bro. I'll wait, you're gonna wait. He said, "I'm not waiting. I'm fine. I want to fight." So we we get into a huge fight. He wins. He ends up fighting Bob Luce, bro, and uh, he knocked Bob Luce out. I think in the first round. And 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 you know what? He was a hundred percent right because when he did, 
it made everybody respect and love him even more. And then they really couldn't wait to see the fucking Tito fight. Is that normal? I mean, to be, because, you know, getting a note, Chuck, and seeing how, again, like, calm, cool, collective he is, is that, and I want to hear from both of you on this, is that out of the ordinary to be that just kind of neutral pre and, and post? Obviously, like, the guy can get up for, for the big moments, but... Um, it's, it's different. It's, it's, it's different than, than most fighters. I'm not going to say that Chuck Liddell's the only guy that was like that. That's not true. But for the most part, those guys are very few and far between. There's, some, there's something wrong with you. If you're not nervous going into a fight or if you're not concerned about whatever, but Chuck was always just, you know. I, you know. I just love being out there. And like I said, like I've always thought, said, as long as I did everything I had to do to get ready for a fight, I, that, and by the way, by the time training camp stopped, I had done everything that I could do. Yeah. There's, not, there's nothing left. There's no time left to train anymore. So worrying about it and being nervous about it isn't going to make you any better. Yeah. You know, if you all, and it's actually going to make you worse. I, that's how I felt. It made me worse. So for me, I just said, let it go. And just, I'm going to go out there and fight. How much are you guys even uh, chatting or communicating pre, uh, pre-fight? Is there, do, Dana, do you try to like, you know, give you know, people I, their space? I, or? I think both him and John, yeah. my trainer, d- didn't really talk to me too much the night before. Like, cause I think they were, I was me, like me trying to settle them down. Cause they were ner- more nervous than I was. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, like, nervous parents. Nervous yeah. Like, like, hey, guys. Yeah, I, I, I only communicated with Chuck when I had to. I, I stayed away from him, let him do his thing, and, uh, you know, I, I had nothing to do with his training anyway. That's all him and, and his crew at the time. But, uh, you know, no, I, for the most part, I left him alone unless, unless I needed something or uh, he needed something. And I'm sure it's just like managing, uh, you know, any uh, sports team, unless right? He was like... bringing me down to the lobby to wrestle, wrestle guys or... <laughs> Down to the lobby to wrestle guys. What did he say? He right. said, <laughs> oh, he said unless you were bringing him down to the lobby to wrestle guys. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah, that was a bad one. Yeah. Yeah. He, we're, I think I think Lorenzo the next day was like, what do you? He's telling a story about me wrestling this guy in the lobby at the Boston Harbor Hotel. Oh shit. And then he's and going to get cannolis at like twelve o'clock at night. And he's like. <laughs> He's got a fight in six weeks. What, what the hell is? What, what the hell do you have him yeah. wrestling guys and eating cannolis? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's not on the uh, on the agenda. This guy. Oh, let me tell you the story. I'll make it real quick. Please. I was talking shit downstairs in, in the hotel in Boston that, that all that UFC stuff ain't shit and this and that. And wait, blah, wait. Blah, blah, blah. A guy in Boston talking shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and he was a security guard at the hotel. Oh, come on. So Chuck Chuck was up in the room playing video games. Finally, I got tired of talk, listening to this guy's shit. <laughs> and I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you I'll give you 1500 bucks if you can last. I don't remember what it was. If you do, Chuck, like five minutes or something. We, so he's <laughs> like, you're on. I fucking go upstairs and get Chuck and bring Chuck down in the lobby. And him and this dude start wrestling. <laughs> and... Uh, Chuck grabs onto him and, and, and put him in, I think, a guillotine and, and, and just starts strangling this guy, right? <laughs> and uh, so Chuck lets him go, and the guy starts saying, he's screaming, I can't see, I can't see. My eyes, what happened to me? I, can't. I said, oh, shit. I, like, threw the 1500 bucks on him and ran upstairs. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm probably going to get fucking arrested or sued or something. Uh, the guy next day looked like C-3PO. He's like, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, big fan, Mr. Odell. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, dinner money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I saw one rant you had, Dana, just talking about your, your uh, you know, say what you think mindset, which, you know, and we were talking about, you know, Vince McMahon earlier. Are there people that you've looked up to coming up in life in general or maybe your uh, people in your family that, that kind of instilled this, like, you know, um, way of of living and thinking as far as like speaking your your mind and being honest with people and not taking shit or did that come from kind of getting the you know the the hustle and bustle of the business like uh inside of you well i think i think all of us growing up that 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 grew up when i did you know at at that point in time you had if something ever went bad in, in in your business or in a sport or whatever you'd always have this guy come out read a canned statement by a lawyer and, and you always said, this is such a crock of shit. It's so, these guys are so full of shit. And, and I never liked that. So, so, you know, my thing was always, well, here's the truth. 
You don't like it, you don't like it. This is what really happened. This is the truth. This is how I feel. This is whatever. And uh, yeah, that's it. And some people, there's were, no yeah. real reason. I just growing up, I always used to call bullshit on all these things. People, uh, yeah, you strike me as the kid too that was maybe on the playground that when kids were kind of getting into scuffles, you were you were the one in the background. I want to imagine that was like fight, 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 hey, and getting taking bets from teachers and shit. <laughs> No, I, I used to instigate fights for yeah, sure. That's what I'm saying, dude. I knew it. Take wait, take me back to one. Do you, do you remember? Was there a lot of like what fights in elementary school or high school or what? How did you how did you get that going? Yeah, I went to I went to school here in Vegas, and every single day after school, somebody was fighting. There was a fight somewhere at the park, uh, in the parking lot over here, you know. And every weekend all the schools in Vegas would fight the other schools. So there were, there was literally fights going on all the time. And I love fighting. I loved everything about it, whether it was boxing, whether it was, uh, you know, kickboxing fight, um, a street fight, no matter what it was, I was always into fighting. Uh, that's, uh, is it one of those things too now where- I mean, and, You talk uh, like box aerobics at one point. You talk box aerobics? <laughs> Wait, what? I did. So, you know, Chuck obviously said that like a ball buster, but I, I love that shit. I, I loved, I used to teach boxing. We used to teach classes. We used to teach privates. Oh yeah. I, and I mean, uh, I there's a guy out of Boston named Peter Welsh. You might give him who, a hard time. Who, <laughs> who I, he's a street fighting legend back there. And I consider the guy, you know, my sensei in the fight business. And uh, yeah, he and I had a business together. It's got to be a yeah, great workout. Awesome. There, are there certain? Oh, it's uh, a great workout, and I, and I, and to be honest, I, like all my, that's a lot of what I did in my classes. I just didn't call it that. And I, don't, I think yeah. I, I think somebody had a video of him with one of the, with a head, headpiece in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we with one get, of the headsets. Yeah, yeah, we had to give him a hard time about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, honestly, I, you know, I taught uh, when I had my kickboxing school. I, I did bunch, as many of those classes. I did real fighting classes. If not more, those are the ones that actually paid. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are the ones that actually paid money. And actually, the guys. That oh yeah, of, of course. Classes. Chuck does the tough guy classes, and mine were not tough guy classes, apparently, according to Chuck. Chuck taught box aerobics too, but his were tough guy box aerobics classes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's got to be a, sh a shit ton of just like you know types of workouts that people probably you know, aren't privy to that you guys are that, 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 you know, people are doing to prepare. Right. Do you, do you not even judge at this point? Like if Connor's telling you he's doing, you know, uh, obviously yoga, whatever, like certain things that maybe sound unorthodox. Are you just like, yeah, dude, do what you got to do. If it works. They, they got the new train, that training center in Vegas. It's pretty awesome. All right. They, the, the, I mean, I, I, I still haven't been out there. I can come out and check that out. Dana, some, sometime soon. I, I've been yeah. A lot of these fighters have their own, uh, you know, obviously all their own trainers and, and, and uh, techniques and, and w whatever it might be, you know, th they all do their own thing. We, we have uh, the PI here in Las Vegas, uh, you know, the, the UFC Performance Institute, where we have literally hired the best of the best, where these guys can come out here and learn how to cut weight properly, strength and conditioning. We have physical therapists, uh, dietitians, the whole deal. So, you can come out here and, and, and use our people or, or you can use your own. That's dope. And Ve so Vegas is, uh, I mean, when did it become the, the kind of the, uh, what, home base for, uh, for the sport? Is that fair to say? When we bought the company. Yeah. Now, when we bought the company, you know, me and the Fertitta brothers are, you know, all based out of Vegas. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this, this became, you know, the headquarters for the UFC in 2001. So again, talking about Rogan moving to Austin, how did you, when did he become a part of, of your um, world? I, I saw a clip of you, you know, dogging on Larry Merchant, uh, which I mean, I used to feel that exact same way about him getting involved in those matches for HBO. And like, you know, obviously famously being like, if I was 50 years younger, I'd fucking fuck you up, motherfucker, whatever he's saying. But it, I was always just like, man, I feel like he's not reading the room. I feel like he was always stepping in. It was almost like a, uh, you know, the way that people come up to me after shows and pitch me jokes, you're just like, dude, fucking take a beat, take a set. Like the show just got over it. Like just kind of, so, so when, when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, Dana's real fired up, but I was like, he's not wrong. So did, did obviously taking that in, uh, contribute to your, uh, 
you know, getting, getting Joe involved? 100%. So one of the things that I hated in boxing, I'll give you a perfect example. I mean, we were just talking about DMX, the famous walkout of Mike Tyson walking out to DMX. Uh, like the first time anybody heard DMX, you know, was when Tyson walked out. Listen to the fucking commentary. The guy is literally shitting on Tyson the entire walk. It, it's, it's fucking horrendous. I can't remember who it was. He's one of the brothers there. The brothers that used to cover sports. He's one of the brothers. Um, but he, he sounds like a, like, a, like a jack off the entire time Tyson's walking out. And what you have to remember is all these people just paid money to watch Mike Tyson fight because they like him. And then you listen to these, these, these fucking guys who've never fought a day in their life ripping them apart the whole time they fucking walk out there. Um, and, and our approach has been different. You know, you, you can break down the fight. You can do this. You can do that. But, but you don't have these guys sitting there just tearing the fighters apart. Um, you know, I always hold HBO as the gold standard of boxing, you know, uh, but the commentary was always terrible. Terrible. <laughs> And so you knew when you watch HBO yeah. boxing it was beautifully, it was done beautifully, it was shot great, everything else, but fucking mute the commentary. Chuck, would you ever like listen or go back and, and hear uh, what people would say like during the match? Would you watch the game tape like that to yeah, and I listen? I actually watching game tape. The one, the one that got me was when um, I remember was Randy was talking about my, about the first fight we had and said that I didn't hit hard, that he didn't know if I hit hard because I, I didn't hit him. So uh, he actually said that when he was watching me fight the t fight Tito the first time. Oh shit! Um, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. I know what to do next I'm time. Like, here we go. I'm like, I'm gonna see if he, he believes that after this one. And so then uh, Joe was always a big well, fight. I like, I like Joe. Joe the Joe trains. He's done. You know, he's done jujitsu. He's done, done kickboxing. Yeah. I mean, he actually trains. He knows it, but he's also just a, a big fan too. Yeah. Was that kind of what you were looking for? The yeah. thing about Rogan is. R Rogan is excellent at walking people who know nothing about the sport through what's going on verbally. You know, he, he can say he, he'll set up a, a, a submission. He'll tell you what's going to happen in the next couple seconds, what the guy's going to do. And sure enough, he does it. Plus, the other thing about Rogan is when he speaks about the sport, you can tell he's not a, a talking head that's being paid. You can tell that this is a guy who A, knows what he's talking about, and B, is super passionate about the sport. He's the best ever. There's nobody better than Joe Rogan. Um, he's, the, he's the best to ever do it in combat sports. Yeah, I don't always agree with him. I don't always agree with his opinion on everything, but it's like he's good enough that I I I, I respect his opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, we, even if I differ on something like so, I can I can listen to him. He's not a, he's not a guy that I want to turn off. I, I like hearing what he's saying. Yeah. And see what he's doing. Like he's not one of those guys like he's talking about where with all those boxing guys. I can't. I can't. You know. And that matters, right, for the spectator. I mean, you. you fan uh heavy and like that's really what's driving uh, everything right so it's like i mean the viewing experience i is like uh that's such a big part of it and joe's voice and and like you said his passion is genuine enthusiasm uh, when he's I, talking about it i think it. it's more important in mma too because if there's so many different things there's so many different things to understand if you're a new fan and to understand what's going on and he, right. he really helps talk to new fans that don't really understand what the the intricacies of stuff totally and and that's what i was just gonna say you know a guy like joe rogan isn't there for the chuck liddell's and the guys like that and, and let me tell you fighters you know th these these guys and girls that fight in the ufc are literally the baddest motherfuckers in the world but boy are they a sensitive bunch uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> holy Holy oh, fuck! They don't like criticism. Oh yeah, people like that. I get, I get, people get mad at me when I say stuff. If I, if I, if I even pick someone to beat them, like and later on they'll be like, "You picked that guy." Yeah. I'm like, what, 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 sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah. How could you? How could you have a favorite wait, in a wait, fight? Oh wait, you lost to him, right? <laughs> yeah. I was right, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do you? Uh, I don't know. Negotiate with the emotions there. Yeah. Listen, it it happened. I mean, you've seen it publicly with me and many guys before. I mean. um, it, it, it happens. I, you know, I'll say something and they, they get upset with what I said. And, and, uh, you know, it, it all gets worked out in the end, but you know, it, it happens. When, when Connor came along, uh, was that, um, I'm, I'm curious just from your, uh, 
you know, uh, angle? Was it like another kind of a Chuck situation where you found this guy that you were like, oh shit, people don't see what I see? Was it, uh, I don't know if I'm in the minority, not knowing the story of just how you kind of plucked him and got him in because it, it seemed like another Chuck type guy as far as being like larger than life, right? Yep, I, I saw it the first night I met him. I went out to dinner with him. And uh, where Hooters, all we had dinner together at this place called Strip Steak at Mandalay Bay. When I left the dinner, I got my car and I called Lorenzo Fertitta and I said, Lorenzo, I don't know if this guy is a great fighter, but if he can even throw a punch, this kid's going to be a huge superstar. And, uh, you know, obviously, Connor's personality is off the charts, you know. He's funny, uh, he's smart, very witty, and, uh, you know, just an all-around cool guy. So, uh, and guess what? He can fight, too. So, um, yeah, I saw, I saw that one coming. And uh, you don't know how big they're going to be. You don't know he's going to be turned into this massive global superstar that he's become but I knew he had the potential to be a big star. Yeah, again, it's like not something just the way with comics and you're writing a bit, you're, you don't know if that's going to be a thing that might, you know, go viral, be a, a big closer for a special, but it's, uh, I mean, he definitely helped globalize the sport, yeah, and add some extra love outside the States. 100%. People are now, obviously, like you got the Paul brothers uh, jumping into fighting and whatnot and wrestling. Is there ever a cutoff for you with the competition? Are you just like, fucking bring it? Like, I've seen you in... And, and Chuck can speak to this too, but I've seen you in interviews say like, you know, I want the best to fight the best, right? Which I love. So, and uh, and I think you were even talking about Connor in particular in one instance about people, if they don't think he's still, you know, at the top of his game are fucking nuts. And um, I think it was actually to a, to like a 90 year old woman. She was like, I don't think he's got it. And you were like, shut the fuck up. No, I'm joking. But uh, no, it was, uh, <laughs> but no, it, but but just the crossover, like, is there, are you one of those guys that's just so open to like whatever's great for the sport? I want to hear your take on that and then Chuck too. Yeah, I think that, you know, listen, obviously, you know, th th this kid's a YouTube kid. It's not like this guy's, you know, a fighter or going to be a fighter. And, th and there's a market for that. There's people that want to see, you know, can this kid beat this kid? Can this celebrity beat that celebrity? There's always going to be a market for that type of shit. Um, I am into who's the best in the world. I want to see the best fight the best, work their way up, and who can become a world champion. And then once you are, how, how long can you keep it? Uh, how many times can you defend it? I mean, that's what I'm into. Wasn't there a time when – well, Chuck, what's your, what's your take on that too? I The same way. Like, there, there's, a, there's a market for it. It's not my market. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm a fight fan. I want to see the best guys fight the best guys. I want to see, see who's the best at the sport. Um, but, you know, those guys fighting, uh, you know, if someone wants to watch it, people are paying to watch it. Guys are getting paid to fight each other. Fine. You know, they make, you make it, making your money, making money how you want to. You know, but, you know, I, I'm, I, it is what it is, man. It's, yeah. I mean, wasn't it's there. It's, it, you know, those guys, they, they're good at making money, getting people to, to watch them. Yeah, getting eyeballs, right? I mean, it never hurts to get more eyeballs. Wasn't Bieber talking about fighting Tom Cruise at one point? Yeah, yeah, those guys were talking about fighting. Is that how, um, do, you, do you just laugh like you're doing now at that idea? Or oh, do you, shit. Hey, I'll do that fight in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying, dude. That's what I'm saying. Like, I, you imagine how many pay-per-view buys that one would do? It'd be, it would break every record on earth. Oh, dude, yeah, there's got to be, like, I mean, there's, and see, that's where my, like, as, you know, as a comic, like, that sounds so funny to me, but also then you break it down and you go, well, shit, man, like, I've seen Bieber's, like, workout vids. I know Tom Cruise is obviously does his own stunts. Like, I watched Tom Cruise fighting underwater, and I'm like, I sprained my fucking ankle getting out of an Uber pool. Like, we are not on the same level. But, like, so, so you want to see these guys in that different uh, spot. Um, that's dope. Well, Dan, we got just, like, two more minutes. Do you mind just doing a, a last quick round-robin 10-question uh, thing with us real quick? Let's do it. All right. And thanks again for making time, dude. Pleasure, and um, it's been awesome. All right, Chuck's going to do it up. So, Pleasure's mine. Thanks, bro. You never got to be on Inside the Actor Studio with the uh, late, great James Lipton. But you know what? Let's be honest. It was inevitable at some point. So we want to give you uh, Lipton's famous 10-question closer. Chuck and I will take turns reading these questions just to get a little more uh, insight into who Dana White is. Go for it, Chuck. Okay. What is your favorite word? Fuck. 
Yeah, 100%. What is your, <laughs> what is your least favorite word? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, my least favorite word. It, it would have to be the C word. Okay, what turns you on? I won't even say it. I hate it so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What turns you on? Bad teeth. <laughs> well, that's on. <laughs> that's on, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, what turns you off? Oh, you, off. You, did you say on? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, he on. said on. Yeah. On. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> we both had a moment. Oh, dude. And that's turns the. Turns you on, bad teeth. <laughs> Dude, perfect. And that's the cold open for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking awesome. That was amazing, all right. dude. Yeah, all right. What turns me off is bad teeth. Great. Good answer. What turns me on? Great teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Uh, uh, we already got what's your favorite curse word. That, yeah. I, mean, I think we already got that one. What's your yeah. favorite curse word you already got? Yeah. So go on. Uh, what sound or noise do you love? I, I would probably say the ocean. Okay, what sound or noise do you hate? What sound or noise do I hate? Ah, oh, it doesn't bother me. Um, probably horns. I fucking hate horns. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer, yeah. Uh, all right, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I, I always said that if, you know, if this wasn't my, my, my path in life, I probably would have went into the military. Fuck yeah. Okay, what what profession would you not want to do? No chance. Construction. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I didn't know for that in college and uh, decided they, they kept going, you can make a lot of money doing this. I'm like, uh, no, this tells me stay in college. <laughs> That's what I'm getting from this. You know, you can quit and do, do this job. There is not enough money to pay me to do construction. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> What I want God to say to me when I arrive? These are Lipton's questions. I'll do it as Lipton. Dana, if heaven, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you at the pearly gates? Even though you didn't believe, we're still going to let you in. <laughs> dude, <laughs> fuck yeah, dude. Dana White, you're the fucking man. Thanks for making time, dude. Hopefully we get to see you live in the flesh real soon, man.